it's also uh, Judy for, for having me having me back, and uh, it's always lovely to come back to uh, to the faculty here, and, uh, and I won't do my sums on on how far I go back. Uh, um, 1974, I don't go quite that far back, but not too far off it. Um, I just want to check before I go on. Uh, uh, I'm mindful this microphone's a little away from me. Can you can you hear me at the back? Okay, are you okay up there? So give me a yell if I if I start fading. And um, so what I thought uh, in the time I have uh, the time I have uh, with you is um, is share with you um, one of the, the the largest studies in. Uh, in an ARC research uh, linkage grant that um, that myself and Judy and Jeanette and Jenny uh, held, looking at um, mathematics engagement and uh, and disengagement in um, uh, in the middle years from years five to eight, uh, I hasten to add though the implications for uh, for, uh, for the younger kids and, uh, and older kids uh, are evident, and I'll point those out as I go. And so what I'll be doing is, is sharing with you um, uh, that, that study which has been published in, in, in a couple of ways in various outlets. And, uh, and as I proceed through the study, uh, not only will I be sharing some of the findings from that, but I guess um, also sort of pausing and, uh, and, and making observations as to, um, as to their, you know, their significance for classroom teaching classroom practice. So, uh, so even though I proceed through a research study, I want to stop at various points and, uh, and give my two bobs worth and my value added along the way. The study I'm going to be uh, talking about explores predictors of students' mathematics aspirations and also uh, predictors of students' disengagement in maths. As I said, it's years five to eight. And uh, we studied this in the, in, in the context of the realities of, of, of the educational structure. So we have students nested within classrooms and classrooms are nested within schools. Um, and uh, also we adopted a, an ecological uh, approach in, in identifying uh, various factors from student to home to classroom to school that uh, may predict students switching on to mathematics or switching off from mathematics in these middle years. And so um, I don't have to tell you guys about um, mathematics being a, a fundamental uh, enabling science and so it underpins so much research and development and innovation in this country and beyond. Uh, from business through to health through national, to national security, maths is, is fundamental to all of that. Um, we do identify, as Judy's rightly noted, uh, that there are dips in mathematics uh, achievement in the middle years, uh, and um, and uh, disengagement has been identified as a factor in this uh, in this declining uh, in this declining trend in the middle uh, school years. Um, and also, Judy rightly noted that um, you know there's a there's a drop in numbers enrolling in high high level maths, and so. Students at a certain level of, of gaming the system, so that if you're you know, pretty good at maths and you do a lower level of maths, a you can do well in those uh, you get band sixes and so on. Uh, if you're in New South Wales, and uh, uh, but uh, in some ways, uh, but also um, uh, you're able to spend less time on maths to get to, to get these high results, and therefore distribute your efforts to other subjects and do well in that. In effect, bringing up general ATARs and so on, and so uh, so the price to pay is that we have you know, kids who are able to do high level maths uh, uh, in many cases uh, choosing not to do that, and that then translates into uh, the uh, the teachers we have and their levels of maths, um, and also uh, but, but uh, careers uh, uh, you know careers not just teaching but uh, but the workforce more broadly, and so bringing that into consideration, uh, there are market skill shortages in maths. And, uh, and, and concerns about the quality of maths uh, graduates in the labour market. And, um, and in reviews of this issue, uh, we have uh, various, uh, uh, various councils and, uh, and, and institutes and bodies and, and agencies 
have identified the importance of, uh, of focusing more closely on students engaged in mathematics. And so, uh, and so um, these agencies and organisations uh, not only identify engagement as a desirable in, end in itself, which it is, uh, as you know, teaching a student is engaged is a delight. Uh, and, uh, and teaching a student or students who are disengaged, uh, that lesson crawls. Uh, and in some ways you do end at the end of the term in the principal's office and say, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this. Uh, and, uh, but not only is this horrible in itself, but also um, a means to enhance subsequent outcomes such as achievement and longer term participation in maths. And so inherent in what I've been talking about are two phenomena. First, there's a lot of kids who seem to be switching off from maths. And second, uh, there's a lot of kids who do not seem to be switching on. Uh, and so, uh, given that, it's important to uh, arrest uh, or reverse any, uh, uh, any disengagement that's going on, but also to foster uh, greater engagement at the same time. And so, I'm making a, a an important point here. Um, engagement and disengagement are not at opposite ends of the one continuum. Uh, and so uh, you can have uh, you can have a student who's um, who uh, um, who may not be disengaged, but they certainly may not be engaged either. They're just fairly flat in this classroom. They're neutral, and uh, and so. That's a good example of how um, of how these are two two uh, two factors, and so it's important not just to uh, uh, to attend to any disengagement. Uh, that sort of gets you halfway there. The other part of the job is to then switch them on. Uh, so it's important not to uh, sort of uh, have them not switching off, but it's also important to have them switching on. And so, um, to our knowledge, no study had actually looked at this in the one integrative uh, analysis, students switching on and students switching off. And so given that middle school is a very important point where behaviours, attitudes and emotions are developing with regards to maths that then will translate into their senior school subject choices. Uh, middle school is therefore an important point to, to, uh, to attend to these issues. And so uh, we also know that negative attitudes and emotions and behaviours with regards to maths uh, that develop early persist into school life and beyond school. And so, uh, and um, I should also say that we know that um, because intentions are a reasonable of subsequent behaviour, then looking at students' maths aspirations and intentions in middle school uh, is also important because it's uh, likely to be a reasonable predictor of what goes beyond that. And so, as we're studying how kids switch on and how kids switch off in mathematics, um, it's also important to recognise the ecology within which each student resides. <laughs> And so uh, we're probably well familiar with, uh, with um, such ecological approaches and Bron from Brenner's is one such approach. And so uh, the child is nested within a microsystem and, and, uh, and then a mesosystem and so on. And all these different layers of a child's life continually impact this child. And you will know that, uh, you will see these children to class, coming from a home uh, where various things are happening or aren't happening, and you will uh, you will exp you will feel the impact of that for better or for worse. And so, the factors that are relevant to students' um, educational and psychological development include these: so the child, obviously, him or herself, he or she will be making his or her own decisions and doing his or her own things. Uh, or not, 
but we also have the home and the family impacting. We also have um, uh, their more immediate community, such as the classroom impacting. We have uh, broader communities, such as the school. We have a broader political and social structure that will be impacting these things. And in more recent uh, frameworks, Bronfen Brenner also talked about the passage of time being another, another layer impacting us. And so these layers have provided a really concrete basis for us to identify uh, what sort of factors might be predicting students switching on or switching off. And so what this ecological model does, it helps us identify sets of uh, factors, model sets, uh, it identifies the specific factors and also uh, identifies the way we go about our analysis. And so in terms of model sets, these are the factors, these, sorry, these are the sets that we were looking at predicting kids switching on and switching off. You can see some factors that are directly relevant to the student in the home, but you can see some factors are directly relevant to you and your school system. Um, and then there are specific factors within these sets that we know we should be studying when we're looking at kids switching on and switching off from maths. So in terms of student factors, we have their socio-demographics, we might have their, their maths ability, uh, we've got various motivation factors. In terms of the home, we have obviously parents and we have logistic support, so how much they will help them with their maths, their maths homework, will they get a tutor? like that. <coughs> in terms of the classroom, we have the class average ability, so some classes are high level maths classes and some are not. And we also have motivational climate. And so is this a, uh, a, a positive maths climate or is this a climate where, where there's, there's lower levels of motivation at, at a group level? We have school level factors, we have their, you know, the school level achievement, for example, school average achievement in NAPLAN. And then we have time. So in studying students' disengagement today, it's important to know to what extent were they disengaged last week or last year. And the reason that's important is because <coughs> In some ways, the strongest predictor of whether a child's going to be disengaged in maths tomorrow is whether he or she is disengaged today. And so uh, the best predictor of maths achievement next week is you know, how that child went in maths last week or the week before. And this is a really important point for teachers because if the strongest predictor of how a child travels uh, today or tomorrow uh, or next week is how they travelled last time, then you've got to find and do things that get them beyond their prior achievement. So where do you want to get the, the, the value added by the teacher is to get a child beyond how he or she went in last week's test. And because last week's test is the best predictor of their result on next week's test, that's a major challenge for you guys uh, because you've got to find variants beyond the strongest predictor, uh, which is their prior achievement, and so, uh, or their prior disengagement, or their prior future intent, and uh, and so a lot of our research is identifying uh, what factors beyond a child's prior achievement or prior disengagement or prior engagement, what things can a teacher do that go above and beyond that prior achievement, and that's a big part of what this research is about. And so we also studied uh, uh, disengagement at the student level, the classroom level, and the school level. So, this is sort of what the model looked like. We have two outcome variables, future intent or switching on, and, uh, and switching on or disengagement. And you can see we have all these sets and factors that predict these outcomes. And the question is, which sets are most influ influential in predicting switching on and switching off? And which factors within these sets 
Because once we identify that, those things, then we're on the path to intervention. We're on the path to either reducing disengagement and boosting engagement, or sustaining engagement and keeping low disengagement low. So, we have these research questions. To what extent do future intent and disengagement vary as a function of student classroom and school? What are the specific time, student, home, classroom and school factors that predict switching on and switching off? Um, does the link between these factors and these outcomes vary from class to class or from school to school? Um, what's the relative salience of the set? So, for example, are student factors more salient than home factors, for example? Um, are there different patterns and are there congruencies in terms of what predicts switching on and switching off? And so, we had just over 1,500 middle school students from years 5 to year 8, 200 classrooms, 44 Australian schools. And so this is a study in partnership with the Catholic Education Office Sydney Diocese, uh, and so they were the linkage partner for this ARC grant. Um, we got great coverage across classrooms and schools because it was a... Uh, it was a wonderful example of terrific collaboration with a uh, with an industry partner, where CEO and, and particularly staff within it were extremely helpful in getting us into classrooms. And so, uh, and the result is a great sample from which we can draw generalizable findings. So, just over half a female. Uh, you can see the average age there, and um, and the breakdown in terms of primary and high school. So, as I said. Um, uh, Catholic Diocese uh, um, of, uh, of Sydney. In terms of switching on, these are the measures we applied. Uh, it was the future intent to continue with maths. And so here are two sample items. I'm happy to study maths until I finish school. I'd like to continue studying. Oh, thank you, June. Fantastic. <laughs> I'd like to continue studying or training in maths after I complete school. And so on those items, on number two items, the students dis you know, either strongly disagreed or the way through it strongly agreed. In terms of switching off, we administered the disengagement scale for the motivation engagement scale. So an example item, each week I'm trying less and less in maths, another one is I don't really care about maths anymore. Uh, and so students either disagreed or agreed with that. We asked various social demographics, so age, gender, um, uh, language background. We uh, administered a, uh, a maths test uh, that was an adaptation of the, uh, the RAT3. And we, in terms of um, uh, motivational predictors of switching on and switching off, we harnessed three models, the expectancy value model, the flow model, and the maths anxiety model. So in terms of expectancy value, um, and one of the motivational predictors was self-efficacy. So if I try hard enough, I believe it will do all the maths were given to me. Valuing, uh, an example of that was learning in maths is important. Flow, so we ask them when I'm doing maths, I feel pretty happy. And anxiety, and I worry about maths and maths work. So these were the motivational predictors of whether a student would switch on or switch off. <coughs> we asked about uh, their parents' interest in maths, their father and their mother or male and female caregiver. We also asked if they received uh, tutoring in maths at home and we also were asking if they had, had access to uh, home maths computer programs or maths internet sites and so on. And so that was the home side of things. What about classroom? Well, uh, we were able to identify the average ability uh, of maths in the classroom. We, were also, we also asked about the cl motivational climate of the classroom. So, for example, for self-efficacy, in my maths class, students believe they can do a good job on the schoolwork. In my maths class, students believe that what they're taught is important and useful. Uh, in my maths class, students enjoy the subject. In my maths class, students get quite anxious about the schoolwork and tests. So that was getting an anxiety climate in the classroom, the climate for flow in the classroom, valuing the self-efficacy. So not only do we have individual students' motivation, but we assess their perception of the class climate overall. 
um, we also asked about the client, the um, the uh, the uh, to what extent the, the class was switched on, and to what extent the class was switched off. Um, we also had school variables, so school size, uh, school SES, uh, their NAPLAN, uh, numeracy NAPLAN score, the percentage of non English speaking background in the school, uh, staff student ratio, and so uh, these are the school factors. And as I said, we also assessed time. So we had their ratings of their future intent from one year earlier, and we had their disengagement scores from one year earlier. And remembering, big challenge for teachers is to go beyond prior variance to add further value uh, beyond what that child was doing last week or last year. And so uh, we're, the, the analysis focused on the multi-level uh, modelling for that project. And so uh, some, some of the major results, the first was variance components analysis. Now what's the, what this does, it, it asks how much does uh, disengagement, how much is that, uh, does that vary from student to student? How much does that vary from class to class? And how much does it vary from school to school? And the answer to this question has big implications for intervention because if most of it's at the school level, then you run school level intervention. If most of it's at the classroom level, then whole class interventions. But if most, more, most of it's at the student level, then we're into the area of more differentiated instruction because you've got you know you know 16 or 17 very different you know uh, bodies in front of you. As you can see, the bulk of disengagement uh, is explained at the student level. So there is more variation from student to student in disengagement than there is from class to class and school to school. And so what this is saying is uh, is. Um, have a bunch of individuals in front of you, uh, and so uh, and then we find this again and again in our motivation and engagement research. And so, rather than seeing your classroom as some sort of homogeneous uh, uh, sort of body and, and one size fits all, certainly in terms of disengagement, that is not the case at all. You have very differing disengagement patterns within your class. Same with um, future intent or switching on. Ninety percent of the variance of the student. Uh, level, and so there's only four percent variation from class to class. So after you account for student-student variation, there's not so much from class to class or school to school. The bulk of variance in motivation and engagement resides at the student level again, which means um, more differentiated approaches within a classroom is essential to address uh, disengagement and uh, and engagement, and that's. In addition to you having to find variants beyond their prior achievement or disengagement, is the second major challenge for teachers, and that's the diversity within a classroom. And uh, and so that's you know if you're sort of top five challenges, one is to find variants beyond what a child is has done before. Uh, another is certainly the diversity in the classroom and the challenges of teaching to that. Um, Now I could, I could show you the, the final model, which looks something like that, and uh, but I won't do that. What I'm going to do is, you know those, those questions, uh, those questions that I, that I threw up uh, a few slides ago, I'm going to go through each of those and answer them. And so the first question, to what extent do future intent disengagement vary as a function of student, class and school? Well I just answered that, to so the bulk of variance and switching on and switching off in maths is is at the student level. Um, at the, uh, in terms of disengagement, 12% uh, variance at the classroom level uh, and, and the school level, and for future intent, 10% variance. So there is a bit of variation from class to class and school to school, but not so much after you've accounted for the variation within your class. What are the specific time, student, home, class, and school factors that predict future intent? Well, for future intent, uh, and disengagement, so for future intent or switching on, time was the most significant factor. So just what I was saying, the best predictor of whether a kid was switching on today was how much he or she was switched on last week or last year. So that being the case, are there other things 
that can play into this mix? And the answer is yes. As far as student factors, the strongest predictor of switching on was their self-efficacy, so how confident they were as a maths student, their valuing of maths, how important, useful, relevant, meaningful, interesting, and fun they thought maths was, and their enjoyment of maths. That also was a significant predictor of whether a child would switch on to maths. Home factors, significant predictor was their father or male caregiver's interest in mathematics. And as far as classroom factors go, the perceived climate of enjoyment in the maths class, so how much they felt the class enjoyed maths, was a significant predictor of whether they would switch on or not. This, you'll see there's a negative sign after this, and this was an interesting frame of reference effect. Um, because the more they saw other kids enjoying maths in the classroom, uh, the less uh, they sort of enjoyed it themselves. Uh, frame of reference effects are not unusual. And so, for example, the classic one is the big fish little pond effect. And so the higher the ability, uh, the average ability of the classroom, uh, the, the lower individual student in that classroom's math self-concept will be. That is, they'll think, oh, everyone else is better than me. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting finding. The more they thought everyone else was switched on and enjoying things, uh, there was a frame of reference effect such that they thought, well, maybe I'm not so switched on. Uh, and, so, uh, and so that's an interesting uh, uh, frame of reference effect you'll need to manage in a classroom. Um, including if you have high ability uh, maths class. What about disengagement? Time again, best predictor of whether a kid would be switching off today was whether he or she was switching <coughs> off um, last week or last year. Self-efficacy again, but a negative predictor. So the higher the self-efficacy, the lower the disengagement. They're valuing, their enjoyment, but interestingly anxiety is coming to this one as well. So we're now getting a sense of how switching on and switching off are different because anxiety significantly predicted switching off, but it was not so relevant to switching on. So the higher their anxiety, the more inclined the child was to switch off. Home factors, mother's interest in maths. So the mother was, and female caregiver was coming into this one. I'm gonna talk about uh, talk about these, uh, this, this interesting nuance in a couple of slides time. Classroom, perceived climate of enjoyment in the maths class was a positive predictor. So the more I think everyone else is switching on and having fun and enjoying, uh, the more I'm starting to uh, question whether I am and the more this, the, this, their disengagement was coming into the frame. Um, and school factors. Uh, so uh, the higher proportion of non-English speaking background students in the school, the lower the level of disengagement and the higher the SES index of the school, the lower the level of disengagement. What about the next question? Does the link between these specific factors and, um, and future intent and disengagement vary as a function of classroom and school? So for example, taking all these predictors I've just gone through, hence intervention points, does the, do those predictors vary from school to school or class to class? And that's an important because if it does, then you've got to identify, well, what predictors are relevant for this classroom? What predictors are relevant for that classroom? And we're into quite complex and, and tricky territory. Or do these factors sort of play out generally uh, in, from class to class? And the answer was yes. Um, these factors seem to play out fairly consistently from class to class and school to school. So the association between the predictors and switching on and switching off generalised across classrooms and schools. And that's really important from an intervention perspective. So you can take these things and, for the most part, uh, have some confidence they will apply to your classroom and your school. What is the rel relative salience of the sets of these factors? Well, the major sets for future intent were time, student and home factors. And the major sets for disengagement seem to be time, student, home and classroom factors. Do the patterns of results differ for future intent and disengagement? 
And the answer is, um, in a lot of cases, no. But in a lot of cases, there are different effects for switching on and switching off. So disengagement predictors, the predictors of disengagement are more, more wide-ranging. The entire ecology seemed to play into disengagement. And so disengagement is being impacted by from the individual student factors all the way through to home and school factors. It seemed to be there seemed to be more predictors of disengagement. So disengagement is a result of a lot of things playing into it. Maybe getting back to my earlier, my, my initial comment that disengagement is a rational response. We can always find reasons and factors explaining it. Not easy to deal with all the time, but, but certainly explaining it. Different home factors seem to be relevant to each. And so one interpretation was um, the mother was, was uh, involvement and interest from the mother or female caregiver seemed to reduce disengagement. And so in that sense, the mother seemed more of a protective factor. And the father or male caregiver was more related to higher engagement and switching on. And so more of a promotive factor on the part of the fact father. That, that's an interesting finding. I, I don't want to go too far into interpretation of it. Certainly further research is needed to understand it better. Different student factors were relevant to each, so anxiety had a role in disengagement, but not in future intent. Perceived disengagement climate was relevant to disengagement. And so the more the students thought the class was switching off, so too would they that was not so the case for future intent. Um, congruencies for both of them, just as there are differences uh, in prediction predictors for each of them, there are congruencies. So you can see that time, student self-efficacy, students valuing and enjoyment were predictors of both, and parents were a predictor of both, but they had a slightly different role it seems. And enjoyment of maths also at the classroom level seemed to factor but there was an interesting frame of reference effect that we need to look at more closely. So, um, to stay within the time, the time allotted to me, uh, um, what I wanted to do in this session was walk you through a major research study that was part of a larger research project. Uh, and so, this was the quantitative side of this research project, a research program. There was also a major arm that was a qualitative approach that we have been publishing on and continuing to, to work through that data. And so it was, a, it was a nice mixed methods research program. And you can chase up these findings and read them in further detail in these two journal articles. And so I guess I wanted to um, uh, also not only work through a research study and its, and its rationale and methodology and findings, and stop at various points and identify factors that are relevant and implications for you guys uh, as, uh, as uh, mathematics educators. Um, so I think I've got a little bit of time for, for questions.